Good evening, Mr. Barua. Good evening. Am I audible yes, and yes. visible? Yeah, yeah, you are. You are. Okay, wonderful. Am I audible? Yes, you yes. are. Okay, so we will uh, wait for maybe another. Two to three minutes, and then oh, take your time. Yeah. Take your time, please. Okay, 
सुनते हैं क्या मेरे ऊपर लाइट बंद कर दो गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन आई एम एक्सट्रीमली ऑनर टू बी कंडक्टिंग द फर्स्ट ओम प्रकाश टिब्रेवाला मेमोरियल एंडोमेंट लेक्चर ऑन रीबाउंडिंग इंडियन इकोनॉमी वे फॉरवर्ड एज वी रिफ्लेक्ट ऑन द लेट श्री ओम प्रकाश टिब्रेवालाज लाइफ एंड हिज कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन especially towards the federation we must heed the vision laid by him and deliberate on the future i am deeply humbled and thankful to mr abhik parwa chief economist and executive vice president uh, hdfc bank who accepted our invitation to deliver this memorial lecture for the information of our participants uh, we uh, we request you to uh, you know put down all the questions that you have uh, in the qna session and uh, we would have a detailed uh, moderated qna session towards the end so all your questions will be taken up i now uh, request our president mr ramakant uh, inani to deliver the welcome address Mr. Inani, are you on mute? Yeah, now now you stand. Uh, now I am audible. Now. Audible? Now I am audible. Okay. I extend my warm welcome to Mr. Abhik Barua, Chief Economist and EVP HDFC Bank. Mr. Arun Luarka, Trustee OP Tibrewala Foundation and Past President FTCCI. Mr. Abhishek Tibrewala, Managing Trustee, OP Tibrewala Foundation, and Management Committee Member of FTCCI. My colleagues, Mr. K. Baskar Reddy, Senior VP FTCCI, and Mr. Anil Agarwal, Vice President FTCCI, Members of Management Committee and Past Presidents, Distinguished Guests, Invitees, and Participants, Press and Media, Ladies and Gentlemen. It gives me. immense pleasure to welcome you all to today's op tibrewala memorial endowment lecture on rebounding indian economy way forward organized by ftcci i thank mr abhik barua chief economist and executive vice president sdfc bank for consenting to be the speaker welcome you sir sri om prakash ji tibrewala was born on 5th june 1933 at jhunjhunu in rajasthan He shifted to Hyderabad in the year 1955 to start his business career. Sri Tibrewala, a management committee member of the then Federation of AP Chamber of Commerce and Industry, from 1960 1976 onwards, and he became president of FAPCCI for the year 2002 and 3. During his tenure. FAPCCI he dedicated himself to inspiring business environment in the state and con and continuously strive to resolve contemporary issues his ideas and suggestions were well received by the government and many were incorporated in policies of the government sri tibrewala was also felicitated for his outstanding services and long association with the organization during his presidential period many national and international events were organized to showcase the state as an investment destination he also led a business delegation to singapore to promote trade and industry of our then undivided state he served a lot to pepsi directly and indirectly indirectly in all the endeavors of the government to promote growth more particularly in new tech industry he was also member of consultative committee of various government departments like telecom railways etc 
इंडियन मिस्टर ओम प्रकाश टिब्रेवाला लेफ्ट फॉर हेमेनली अबोर्ड ऑन फोर्थ सेप्टेंबर 2016 इंडियन इकोनॉमी इज शोइंग साइंस ऑफ रिकवरी पोस्ट पेंडेमिक एंड विथ अक्टूबर मंथ स्टेटिस्टिक्स सरपासिंग दैट ऑफ अर्लियर रिकॉर्ड्स इन फैक्ट्री आउटपुट इन अ डिकेट एंड द जीएसटी कलेक्शंस आल्सो क्लोजिंग वन लैक क्रोर्स फर्स्ट टाइम आफ्टर द पेंडेमिक द ऑनगोइंग रिलैक्सेशन ऑन कोविड नाइन्टीन रिस्ट्रिक्शंस बेटर मार्केट कंडीशंस and improved demand coupled with strong output expansion of intermediate goods resulted in positive growth and revival of purchasing managers index that is pmi the stock markets like worldwide our indian markets are also going through all time high india's economy is expected to rebound in 2021 on the bank back of measures taken by the government and the rbi or particularly atmanirbhar package coupled with easing of global trade we wish to enlighten get enlighten on dream of the government to take india to 5 trillion economy in couple of years i am sure today's lecture will enlighten us how to rebound the indian economy practical approaches and strategies needed and their impact on industry thank you one and all thank you mr inani uh, we also have the grandson of uh, shri op uh, om prakash tebrewala uh, mr abhishek tebrewala with us so thank you so much for gracing the occasion and i in fact request him to please uh, share a few words about uh, shri om prakash tebrewala ji uh, th uh, thank you khyati ji to just to inform the audience we have sitting right now in the op uh, tibrewala board room which was dedicated by sri om prakash tibrewala and his photo is affixed on the our right side of this uh, room thank you please thank you kathiji thank you inani ji good evening everyone firstly would like to welcome everyone for the first lecture in memory of my grandfather late sri om prakash ji tibrewala special thanks to mr abhik bora chief economist hcfc bank for accepting invite special thanks to president shri nani ji senior vice president shri baskar ji vice president shri agarwal ji vice president shri luarka ji and entire federation team for organizing the lecture today federation and its members were very close to op tibrewala ji's heart he began his journey with federation in the year 1976 and went on till his last breath that is 2016 day in and day out i used to see him only talk about federation He was extremely aggressive, devoted towards federation. With his charismatic personality, during his tenure, he was instrumental in signing off many national and international events with government of Andhra Pradesh, and also instrumental in signing off many international MOUs. He was also very passionate about taking federation to new heights. He was also an active socialist with Telugu Desam Party, Lions Club, and many other associations. He was a great philanthropist. with vision and objective to always give back to society he was founder and managing trustee for op tibrewala foundation a charitable trust a lot of social and welfare contributions were uh, made by him at lb prasad i institute tirupati tirumala devasthanam hare rama hare krishna mahavir hospital and many more i am very sure today he must be happy watching us post a lecture in his memory at federation house since childhood i was very close to him he was not only a mentor to me but more like a friend and a father He, because of him i am here we miss him a lot thank you i hope this lecture being conducted in his memory would be of great knowledge to all of us i pass on the mic to mr abhik ji to enlighten us further thank you uh thank you so much uh, sir and uh, it's indeed an honor for us and of course uh, due to this pandemic the first one was uh, is being held virtually but we are sure that next one we, we will have a physical uh, event and uh, we move ahead uh, we i now request our senior vice president mr bhaskar reddy to kindly introduce our speaker uh, mr abhik barwa kathi uh, am i audible yes <laughs> it's my privilege uh, to introduce mr abhik barua chief economist and uh, executive vice president of hdfc bank 
Mr. Abhik Barwa, formerly Chief Economist for ABN AMRO Bank and India Economist for Merrill Lynch, member group of economists consulted by the RBI on monetary policy and finance minister on budget. Mr. Barwa, member of working group on 11th five-year plan, standing committee member of RBI industry monitoring group and national committee on economic affairs CII. Mr. Barwa is a columnist for Economic Times and Business Standard, commentator in all major news channels. Uh, Mr. Abu Barua educated at the Delhi School of Economics and the University of Maryland, USA. Uh, now I present Mr. Abu Barua uh, on rebounding of Indian economy way forward on this first Om Prakash Dibrewala mem Memorial Endowment Lecture. Uh, Mr. Abu Barua. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. Am I audible? Uh, to, uh, yeah, right. Uh, thank you very much uh, to FTCCI for giving me this honor and privilege of speaking to you. And a uh, special uh, vote of thanks to Kayati for reaching out to me and facilitating this. I'm indeed uh, honored. And this is, uh, this is a privilege, as I mentioned. Um, I do have a long speech writ written out, which I'm not going to read from. Uh, but uh, the plan is to just highlight some of the issues um, that are that may be important that might seem a little ab abstract. Uh, because I'm an economist, <laughs> you know, work in the domain of the abstract. But I also belong to industry. I'm I'm with a bank, so hopefully I will be able to sort of bridge the divide between uh, what is going on in the minds of economists and policymakers and uh, what in industry might want, uh, might be interested in or, and, and want to know more about. So without much ado, since we are um, uh, speaking in, in uh, very difficult times, uh, uh, let me sort of share, uh, the, let me start with the good news and um, uh, although a lot of this is known to you, I'd like to sort of take you through some bits of good news that might be of interest. Uh, for one thing, to, to begin with, I think uh, the worst is behind us. And uh, I, am, I this is not just hope. Uh, I, I think this, uh, this is an informed decision, uh, uh, judgment that I'm making. And the worst is behind us, both in terms of uh, the incidence of, of the pandemic, uh, as well as uh, the economic impact. So things will look better uh, going forward. And although we are sort of aware of a lot of the achievements that we've made uh, in our battle against uh, COVID, I'd just like to highlight a few things which are um, quite remarkable uh, for an economy of our size and complexity. Uh, first, I mean, a lot of people point to the fact that we have the second largest number of infections in the world. But if you were to um, adjust for the population uh, and compare it to uh, even some of the uh, major developed economies, we are actually much better. because in general, the government was concerned with around July, uh, was the fact that uh, the infection had moved from the big cities and into the interior. And I think one of the key achievements has been that uh, it, the, the infection hasn't really hit the most vulnerable states. And by the vulnerable states, I mean states with relatively poor health infrastructure, you know, broadly what we call the Bimaru states, uh, they have uh, handled it remarkably uh, well. Uh, a small uh, fact, uh, we, along with Argentina, are the only two major economies that haven't had a second wave of the infection. Yes, there have been, you know, localized second waves. I think you've seen it in Hyderabad. I have seen it in Delhi. Uh, but uh, they have been, as I said, localized and have been brought under control. You just have to see what the second wave is doing to countries like the US, Germany, and the UK.
to understand how much worse things could have been. Uh, Mr. Nani mentioned some of the uh, improvements on the economic front. And let me just sort of uh, try and uh, capture it in a few numbers. So when the pandemic started, uh, the forecast by most forecasts, forecasters ranging from the RBI uh, to uh, you know, major banks, think tanks, international agencies, was that we would suffer a contraction of GDP by in double digits. So some were saying 15 percent, 12 some were saying 12 percent and so forth. Um, so this is for the fiscal year 2021. But today we are in a situation where there has been a steady revision of uh, the level of contraction all the way down to seven and a half percent, which seems to be the median expectation. Incidentally, the RBI has uh, revised its expectation down from nine and a half to seven and a half percent contraction. Uh, you know, it, it's still in sort of it, it'll be a contraction because of the first two quarters, but certainly a much smaller contraction that we had anticipated earlier. And I think um, among uh, forecasters like me, um, there is a belief that in the second half, the two quarters of the second half, will see a positive growth. Again, Mr. Nani pointed to, uh, in, uh, to the economic indicators like the GST collections. I could add a number, a, a number of other indicators, e-way bill issuance, electricity, diesel uh, consumption, which you know, for people in industry, it gives you a concrete sense of what these more abstract uh, GDP numbers mean. The fact that we are recovering in GDP terms or in sort of macroeconomic terms is very clearly reflected in the way things are looking on the ground. For instance, you will relate much more to EUA bill issuances or GST collections than an abstract number like the GDP. So there is, uh, the two are matching with each other. So it is both a top-down uh, improvement in GDP forecasts, and there is uh, a sort of a, a, a bottom-up or a micro-level manifestation of that for people like you in industry. Uh, I, I just wanted to flag the issue of employment a little, very quickly take you through uh, just one number. Between uh, April and July, the unemployment rate uh, was 20%. Uh, this was uh, expected because of the lockdown. In November, it came down all the way to five and a half percent. So that's another thing that's um, th that I think we should, you know, add and acknowledge in our list of achievements. One of the main uh, concerns, and since I I'm calling, I'm talking to you from Delhi, and I I do talk to people in in government and policy circles. Um, you know, not just Delhi, but also the RBI in, in, in Mumbai. And I think the big concern at that, uh, at that time when the pandemic hit us uh, was that, is it going to uh, affect agriculture? Is it going to affect uh, food supplies? Uh, and that was the critical concern because, uh, you know, our, the history of the Indian economy uh, simply highlights the importance of the availability. Uh, am I okay? Yes. Yeah. Sir, Mr. Loharika, please mute yourself. Un unmute yourself. Uh, mute yourself. There's a lot of. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, I'm. Am I audible now? Right. Okay. I just I was just talking about the importance of food supply, and that really hasn't been affected. Yes, there are some items, you know, vegetables, um, uh, and uh, pulses, um, you know, e eggs, uh, meat, fish, and poultry, uh, which have shown uh, an upward movement in prices. But in general, 
we are expecting a bumper Kharif and uh, a Rabi crop this year. The, the, the rain gods have smiled on us. So I think, um, you know, in, on, in a number of domains, we have done much better than we had expected to do. Let me turn to the second theme of my lecture, which is uh, how India was unique in terms of handling the crisis. And uh, there might be some problems in being this unique. Um, so India's economic strategy broadly, uh, you know, the, if you think of when, you, when an economy is hit by a shock, there are two strategies that you can adopt. One is a monetary strategy, which focuses on loans, on liquidity, on interest rates. The other is a fiscal strategy, which is to put money in the hands of people, put money in infrastructure projects, and so forth. What we did, and unlike the uh, most other economies, is that our fiscal stimulus or our fiscal package uh, to fight the pandemic was actually very small. And let me just uh, explain to you what I mean by very small. On average, developed countries like the US or Germany or the UK gave a fiscal stimulus equivalent to 11% of GDP. If you take developing economies like India, uh, the level was around 5 to 6% of GDP. For India, the, the, the level, if you add everything together, including support in kind, the food support that was given, to migrant workers and so forth, it works out to a little over 2% of GDP. And uh, I, I would like you to remember this because I think maybe some of the problems going forward uh, lie there. So what did we do instead? Um, we relied more on the monetary system. The RBI uh, was doing the heavy lifting, as you are all aware. Uh, interest rates uh, you know, came down because the RBI slashed the policy rate. You as industrialists would have seen much lower interest rates, much greater availability of cash in the market and so forth. There was another interesting innovation that we did, which was what I would call a hybrid, uh, which was the credit guarantee scheme, the CLGS, where it was actually a combination of a kind of fiscal policy along with credit policy. So the government guaranteed loans uh, to sectors that banks might have avoided because of risk concerns. And they said that, look, we are going to uh, make, make good the loan if uh, these companies default. And um, effectively, a credit guarantee mechanism was put in place. As you are all aware, it was initially for SMEs. And then in the last monetary policy, it has been extended to a whole range of stressed sectors, uh, specifically the stressed sectors identified by Mr. Kamat and uh, his team, which are also eligible for restructuring. From a banker's perspective, let me tell you what our, my take or our take is on this is that this has been an extremely successful scheme. Uh, 300,000 crores were initially targeted under this. Of this, around 1,60,000 crores has already been disbursed. Uh, uh, sanctions have been made for 200,000 crores. And with uh, these new industries, new sectors coming under the ambit of this, um, I, I think the 300,000 crore target will be met. What the RBI has also done, and this is of interest if you happen to be in one of the stress sectors, is that the RBI has um, you know, st started targeted uh, <coughs> op uh, liquidity operations, which simply means that the RBI is giving money to banks at a low rate in order to lend to certain stressed sectors. And uh, so the, there has been a 
sort of a tie in between the ECLGS and this targeting, uh, uh, targeted uh, liquidity support of the RBI. So uh, if you happen to be uh, uh, in a stress sector, this is, this is good news for you. Of course, you are aware of the moratorium. You are aware of the waiver of interest rates on small loans and so forth. So on the monetary side, we've done enough. Uh, the fiscal side, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know, a comparison with other economies, uh, certainly looks very, very weak. So far, so good. I, am, I, I have given you the good news, uh, but it would be remiss on my part as an economist and someone who is involved in both banking and peripherally policymaking uh, not to look at the problems. And let me sort of start by highlighting the key problem. Uh, so we, after the pandemic, we had a major contraction in the economy. 24% uh, contraction. Then in the second quarter, the contraction reduced to 7.5%, which means that even with these very sharp growth rates that we are talking about, if you think of the level of GDP, uh, the, the level of goods and services produced, we will be back to the pre-COVID level or the 2019 N level, if you like, only at the end of 2021, if we are lucky. Remember that. So we've lost a lot of the GDP in the process and getting there is going to be, uh, a well, it, we are seem to be on the right track, but it doesn't mean uh, that our problems are over. What happens after that? And let me sort of talk to you about a couple of issues that um, some experts are raising. One, I think some people are skeptical about the ability of this recovery to sustain. What they are saying is that uh, it's all pent up demand uh, combined with some you know, festival season demand that came in. Uh, the pent-up demand was because of the lockdown. People couldn't step out to buy. That, when the lockdown ended, uh, you know, came into the market, and um, uh, uh, that that uh, really pushed up the second quarter growth rate and part of the third quarter growth rate. After this, there it, it, things are going to flag uh, again. I mean, um, I I think this is debatable. I don't necessarily agree with this. But this is something you will be able to judge and gauge in your specific sectors what is going on, how much of it is pent up demand, how much of it is related to the festival season, and how much of it is a genuine uh, recovery. The other thing that uh, I think commentators uh, point out, and which I think is a legitimate uh, uh, question and, and, and an issue that they raise, that look, even before the pandemic struck, we were going into a phase of a significant slowdown. Let's not forget the fact that for the previous fiscal year, 1920, the last quarter showed a growth of just 3.1%. Uh, we aspire for 7% growth plus in order to reach the $5 trillion target. And there were a lot of problems then. No, which was causing this. Um, one was, of course, uh, what what economists call the twin balance sheet problem. Companies were over leveraged. There was a crisis in the banking system. You know that bad loans or NPAs had gone up. Uh, that was not resolved. Uh, the fiscal situation was also looking pretty bad, both for the center and the states. We were missing our fiscal targets. Um, the GST specifically turned out to be um, extremely burdensome, and I think it contributed to the slowdown in the economy. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you will agree, um, having faced the problems associated with GDP and exports were stagnating. Uh, the claim that these commentators are making is that, look, all th this was there before the pandemic. This hasn't gone away. We haven't really sorted out these problems. 
yes, there have been some reforms, but uh, have we done enough or can we take advantage of the pandemic and the crisis that it has engendered in order to um, address some of these issues head on? Because otherwise, you know, we are, we've been distracted from a policy perspective in just handling the really harsh effect of the pandemic. But some of the longstanding problems will come back to haunt us uh, once we are out of the pandemic. And let's not uh, forget that. Uh, the other problem, which is really very surprising, and this is a, India is really unique um, from that perspective, is that inflation is rising. And if for those of you who you know look at the inflation news um, on the front page of the Economic Times, the Deccan Chronicle, you would have noticed that inflation has been high. And for the last three months, uh, inflation has been higher than 7%. Uh, just to remind you that the RBI's mandated tolerance limit is 6%. It has gone above this on a sustained basis for three months. And this is not just because of two or three vegetables. It's not what we call the POT, potato, onion, tomato, uh, tomato effect. Uh, there, is, uh, um, there are other um, uh, prices which are also going up. And going forward, uh, I, I think those of you who are in the commodity space, know that international commodity prices are rising as there is expectation of a recovery. So inflation is uh, rising, which means that going forward, if you are expecting uh, more help from the RBI, which is ultimately the na nation's uh, inflation manager, you might not get the kind of help, uh, incrementally at least, that you got in the, in, in the wake of the pandemic. Uh, so um, the RBI might not cut the policy rate further. It might actually uh, consider withdrawing a little bit of the liquidity because these things are known to be inflationary. But I think the biggest problem uh, that we have today, and this is something that uh, you know all of us together uh, need to grapple with and have a view on, is that the fiscal situation is extremely bad. And despite the fact that we did not give a very large fiscal stimulus, and I uh, told you about, about the, the, the quantum or the amount of stimulus compared to other economies, because tax collections have fallen short, because we haven't been able to do disinvestments, because other receipts have uh, been a problem, both for the center and states, uh, the fiscal targets have uh, gone for a toss. So we were targeting for the center 3.5% fiscal deficit as a percentage of GDP. For the states put together, it was 3%. So 6.5% was the target before COVID hit us. This was there in the January budget. Uh, what do we have now? We are now expecting in the best possible scenario, 6.5% fiscal deficit uh, to GDP ratio for the center and about four and a half percent for the states. That's 11%. So we have uh, you know, gone over our tar cumulative target of six and a half percent for the center and states together uh, up and move towards 11%. Now there would be pressure to consolidate this and get back to some kind of fiscal path, but this cons rapid consolidation can be dangerous because it will simply mean that the government stops spending and this will again lead to a spiral, a downward spiral of growth. So, um, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, from this perspective, um, uh, in, you know, industry needs to be aware and to the extent, uh, since I'm, I'm speaking to a major chamber of commerce, I would like you to keep this in mind and uh, uh, use uh, whatever influence and uh, you know uh, the space uh, that you have to ensure that this obsession with a very uh, sharp reduction in fiscal deficit is avoided, uh, I, both by the states and by 
the center. Uh, a couple of other things uh, which I wanted to mention was that uh, what is the experience with other pandemics? One of the things that we know is that households tend to increase their savings, precautionary savings after a pandemic, and this tends to uh, be there for a long time. And uh, what happens is that it effectively, if you are raising savings, you are cutting down consumption, so consumer demand is affected. Uh, there is a problem of the, uh, we, we've seen that after phases of low growth or contraction of the economy, the economy's capacity to grow itself is hampered. So going forward, as we, the, the, the $5 trillion economy was mentioned, um, I think we will have a problem uh, simply in, in terms of the capacity to grow after the pandemic is over because of the damage it has wrought and not just the damage of the pandemic, but of the slowdown that preceded the pandemic. And um, getting to that five trillion target uh, would require uh, very, very serious you know, policy measures and reforms. Uh, I also just, you know, since, um, you know, we, we live in a globalized world, and um, even the smallest Indian company is affected by what, is, what happens in, in the global domain. Uh, I just wanted to flag a couple of issues uh, uh, which is happening on the international front before I move on to some solutions that I have. One is the threat of localization. We saw the uh, localization threat coming with Mr. Trump, protection and so forth. Uh, with the pandemic, I think it could be the end of the truly globalized supply chain. So people will say, look, I am not going to depend on uh, if there is another event like a pandemic, I'm not going to be dependent on some supplier in Brazil who might be hit harder uh, than me sitting in India or sitting in Germany. So I might as well have all my supply network as close to me as possible. So localization is a threat and localization is a threat to a lot of um, uh, the sectors and segments who are providing intermediates uh, to a global supply chain. Uh, I think um, one of the things that uh, works greatly to our advantage, and I think this has been discussed uh, so often in, in various forums that I'm not going to spend too much on this, that there is going to be, there has been an active shift away from China in terms of uh, dependence of, for intermediates, for manufactured inputs and so forth. Uh, with the pandemic, I think this uh, there's a concentration risk, which um, uh, would be associated with China, apart from the political issues that they have. So I think there will be a shift away from China and people will start looking for alternative markets and India stands to gain. Um, uh, just a couple of words um, on uh, how, especially for those of you, of you who are in the export uh, domain, uh, that uh, uh, we uh, now the, the 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 consensus of the majority is uh, is that the dollar is in for long term decline, which means that the rupee will be under pressure to appreciate. Uh, again, from an exporter perspective, this is not good news, uh, but this is something that you've learned to, we will have to learn to live with. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that yesterday we were put by the US on the currency manipulation watch, uh, which means that the RBI was uh, you know, buying in you know, dollars continuously and keeping the rupee you know, nice and competitive for you, despite global pressures, uh, the RBI might have to withdraw this. So you will have to learn to live with an appreciating rupee. The only, I mean, the saving grace from an exporter perspective is that we are underperforming some of our competitors. So if you take the Indonesian rupiah, the Thai baht, um, uh, the Ch Ch Chinese yuan, we are appreciating less than that. So that keeps us competitive. Uh, to an extent. Uh, so going forward, uh, I, I mentioned uh, the fiscal issue that uh, we cannot, and I mean, you know, despite this, you know, the, the, there is always a view that 
look, we, we must be fiscally very well disciplined and, um, you know, try and even if we overshoot in one year, let's try and get back to the path of consolidation as soon as possible. Please, this is not in the interest of industry or the economy. And to the extent that you are all influencers, I think you should ensure that the fiscal consolidation is not very rapid. Um, uh, second, I think uh, the potential of the banking system to support growth is, uh, is slowly beginning to decline. As I said, on the one hand, there are inflationary pressures building up. Uh, I mean, there will... that. Um, um, one thing which I want you to ponder over, this is, um, again, since uh, we have a new strategy, we have Atman and Bharat and so forth, um, and maybe we can take this up at the Q&A session. Um, how much can we grow? We have, we have uh, you know, only by import substitution and growing our domestic markets. Uh, do we have to, should we aspire to be uh, aggressive exporters and do all the things that uh, are needed to uh, go up uh, the ladder in terms of our export potential? Or should we perceive, Atmanirbhar Bharat, it does not specify that we are going away from the export uh, uh, driven strategy. But one uh, interpretation which may, people have made is that it is an import substituting strategy and does not uh, rely on exports. Uh, I, I mean, I leave it to you to, to decide for yourself uh, whether import substitution alone can give, give you and your companies the kind of growth uh, that you would ideally like and how it fits into a $5 trillion economy. I believe that we will ultimately have to fall back on exports to give us a push forward. And somehow there, you know, the idea of being an exporter and simultaneously protecting a lot of our industry through tariff increases, somehow they don't go hand in hand. Uh, so let me just, you know, final, you know, final words, uh, some solutions, and we will... I'm sure we can. We will arrive at more solutions in the Q&A session. Uh, so some of the solutions that I have, uh, you know, uh, I was in a seminar in Korea and uh, the Korean industry minister was talking. And uh, one of the things he told me is that if you want to grow a tree, you have to plant a seed. And I think we've tried to grow our, our economic tree without you know, planting the necessary seeds. And I, by this, I mean the emphasis on primary health and education. And I think I hope, you know, COVID hope wakes us up to the need for these, um, uh, for much more spending on these so-called social sectors. Um, I think education and skill development uh, can uh, become uh, you know, much more focused, much more oriented to the needs of industry. I think digital education now has, with uh, the schools being shut uh, because of the pandemic, have, has gained some degree of legitimacy. Let us think of ways in which we can deliver you know, digital modules, uh, maybe, maybe prepackaged uh, digital modu modules, not necessarily online or real time. Finally, um, I think ultimately the solution is private capital. As I said, the government is running out of money, right? Our central government is running out of money. The government of Telangana has, will, will run out of money. Right? We've had a huge revenue shock. We will, we cannot, uh, so we'll have to depend on private capital. And, uh, and by, you know, private capital, I mean a lot of things. It could mean privatization. It could mean aggressive asset monetization, uh, disinvestment, and so forth. 
but there is a limit to which the central bank, uh, the central government can do this. I think the ball is firmly in the state's court. And the way I like to think about things is that, uh, you know, seeing the success and having, you know, visiting Vietnam, I see the dynamism in that economy. And I think we need a lot of Vietnams in, in, in India. So India should be a cluster of Vietnams. And I think a champion state like Telangana, right, which has done, you know, which, which is perhaps leading the reform drive, should provide a template uh, for how other states can become ultimately like Telangana and, uh, and, and then, you know, aspire to become uh, a, um, a new, uh, another Vietnam. And um, but while collaborative federalism is very good, and I think states need to come together, especially in negotiations with the government, and indeed uh, there is need to negotiate a lot of things with the central government, which uh, the states might uh, see uh, going against their interests. But there is also a need for competitive federalism where states compete uh, to get to the um, uh, to uh, uh, outdo each other in attracting private capital. Uh, finally, I think I, I think all of us should push for a fundamental uh, relook at this GST mechanism. This is not working. We might get you know a little more than one lakh crore in a particular month. It, it's not solving. I mean, I, I think there is much more revenue potential if we have a more efficient and more industry-friendly, a more company-friendly GST. Um, and also, again, on the banking side, I think the NCLT process has to be speeded up. Uh, final words, uh, you know, we talk about digitalization, automation, and so forth. Uh, these are uh, things that technological change bring us. But let us not forget the fact that they are labor displacing in some way. Uh, so, while we have to embrace digitalization and automation, we also have to think about ways to employ our uh, you know, 500 million workforce. Uh, and let us not carry, get too carried away uh, with uh, you know, digitalization has its benefits, automation has its benefits in terms of efficiency, but we have to employ people. So we need to have uh, more emphasis. We have to think of ways, and again, collectively, industry should think, think of ways to get into, to, to get sectors that are employment intensive uh, to, gr uh, to grow. I hope, I mean, this is the end of my uh, lecture, which hasn't been um, too short. I was made, hoping to make it a little shorter, but I got a little carried away. Uh, maybe in you know, a parts of it was a little uh, pessimistic. Uh, I, I did uh, talk about the challenges. I'm not fundamentally a uh, pessimist. I, I think I, I see that as a cautious. I see myself as a cautious optimist. Uh, but I and I believe that every crisis brings a whole range of opportunities, and let's all together take advantage of them. And thank you so so very much for um, listening to me and sparing time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barua, for a very enlightening talk. Okay. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions or comments. I mean, it didn't have to be questions, but I would love to hear comments from you on in the different issues that you might think are are important, uh, which I might have missed out on, or yeah. where you bring your perspective. So, uh, Mr. Yeah, sir. Uh, Mr. Sir, one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barwa. I'm Sujata, Deputy of NTPCI. So, with my little economics background, I want to uh, ask you, I'm uh, picking up a few sentences from your speech only. You said uh, there are two policies, uh, two strategies. One is monetary and one is fiscal. So uh, India is uh, low on fiscal uh, stimulus and high on monetary stimulus. But even in the monetary stimulus, it's not up to the expected mark. So, but despite this, we are witnessing high inflation. Now, the other day, we have seen that uh, 
200 uh, plus foundry units have closed down in protest against the rise in input prices in uh, Tamil Nadu. And so there are a lot of problems and uh, inflation is really, really high in every aspect, like intermediate foods or the imports or maybe the food grains and pulses and fruits and vegetables everywhere. So why is this paradox? Now, on one side, we say we don't have money. Not much money is not And on the other side, we have high inflation, double-digit inflation, which is really bad for the economy. So how to deal with this situation? Uh, well, uh, I, I think um, uh, certainly there are problems, there are supply side issues. And if you take a lot of the food products, which have been the principal drivers of inflation, there have been supply side problems. Uh, I think I you perhaps misinterpreted the fact that I said that, you know, monetary policy has really you know worked very hard, has done the heavy lifting in terms of pushing the economy forward. And perhaps you've gone a little overboard in doing that. Um, I, I think that there is, uh, you know, at least sectorally quite a bit of momentum, and that is leading to price pressures, price, um, you know, cost pass-throughs, um, and the global commodity cycle is um, picking up simply because there's so much money in the system, and there is an expectation that uh, the global economy will pick up because of the vaccine and so forth. So things like steel prices, things like other metals are just going through the roof. And uh, so we have a curious situation where, uh, you know, the, the, we have price pressures despite apparently slack uh, growth and uh, GDP uh, contraction. Um, my, uh, you know, my submission would be that on the liquidity side, uh, perhaps the RBI has gone a little overboard. Every day, the banking system has 600,000 crores of surplus cash. Right? This is known to breed inflation pressures. And maybe we need to sort of wind this down very carefully. Let, let's not rock the boat. But I think on the, on the fiscal side, We'll ha on, on the monetary side, we'll now have to be careful going forward. And that is the point that I raised, that you're, if you're expecting any more, much more liquidity support from or you know, uh, rate cuts from the RBI, that's perhaps not going to happen because it's not just a supply side uh, inflation. There is an element of the demand side which is enabling pass through of things like an escalation in intermediate prices to final product prices. And that's something we need to be very careful about. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, may I now uh, request our past president, Mr. Arun Luharika, to kindly mm -hmm. pose the questions for our uh, guest. And also, there we can see a few Q&A which has come on the chat box. So, uh, Mr. Luharika, in case if you may. Yeah, yeah. Have those. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Barwa. Hello. Hello. Please go yeah. ahead. Mr. Yeah. Good, mean, evening, sir. Good evening, sir. See, the IMF has projected a growth rate of 8.8% for 2021-22. And for China, it has projected 8.2%. So again, we'll be the fastest growing economy. Do you think it is possible? Well, the difference between, <laughs> between the two is that this year, China is the only economy which has shown, which is likely to show positive growth. So uh, the IMF's forecast for China is 1.8% positive growth. On top of that, they're expected to do 8.2%, right? We are doing 8.8% on the back of a contraction of 7.5%, in the previous year. So as I said, that because of this contraction, there is a you know, permanent loss in GDP. So if you look at levels, if China was at, both China and India were at 100 um, in, um, at, the, at the end of 2019, uh, China went, goes to 101.8 this year. We go all the way down to 
<laughs> and then from 92.5, we managed to just get back to 100. China goes from 101.8 and has 8.2% growth over that, which is roughly takes it to 110. That is the difference. So let us not, this slogan of fastest growing economy has to be seen very carefully, especially in the context of the pandemic. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Barwa, it's more up to do with the banking whether the NPAs of the bank may grow and some bank may suffer a tire one capital? Um, yes, NPAs will definitely grow. The RBI itself has said that in the baseline scenario, the NPAs will could go up from 8.5% this year, 12.5%. have a slightly better growth rate than was projected, but certainly NPAs are going to um, uh, increase. And um, uh, uh, there is a problem of capital requirement of banks. Uh, so I did have this in my very long speech, which I had written, but I didn't mention it, that we need to have a clear recapitalization plan along with mergers, sales, etc., of uh, banks which are looking uh, structurally weak. Uh, this also goes for NBFCs. Uh, and uh, I think th there will be, you will see a shakeout. Uh, sir, you cannot have this kind of, uh, sh you know, serious hit to the economy and not have a collateral damage to the financial sector. But I will also like to emphasize that we have a number of very solid banks, both in the private sector and uh, the public sector, uh, so that there will not be a systemic crisis, but there will be bank-specific uh, crisis. Uh, but I think the crisis will get handled before we have a situation uh, like um, Yes Bank or uh, uh, the you know Maharashtra Cooperative Bank in uh, in, in in Mumbai. Sir, now uh, I'm coming to international banking. See, uh, as per a report by McKinsey, um, already uh, international banks have lost a business of $3.7 trillion in terms of revenue and the provisioning in uh, current year provisioning is higher than 2019. And they say in 2021, the provisioning may exceed the global crisis. Possible, possible. It depends on how things pan out. Hmm. But uh, as the US has shown, and then Europe followed its example, uh, that they are very quick uh, to sell off bad assets. They're equivalent of the NCLT process. The Chapter 11 process is much more efficient than us. We just keep going to various appellate tri tribunals and make it like any other judicial process where you know, you get justice and no, <laughs> or a bad asset at the end of seven years. They are far quicker. They will resolve this. And, the, uh, you know, the, the great financial crisis showed us how quickly these uh, countries, especially the U.S., can, you know, recapitalize banks. Because if you remember this thing called TARP, I don't know yeah. whether you remember TARP. Yeah. TARP yeah. was basically about, you know, it ultimately became about recapital, quick recapitalization yes. of the bank. Yeah. So, I, they, you know, there is no way in which you can avoid a financial system problem or a crisis after this kind of uh, shock to the global economy. Uh, my hope, I, mean, I, I guess it's just hope, is that we are, we know from the... the um, uh, great financial crisis has left us with some lessons and we will follow those lessons carefully and do things quickly so that this does not sort of morph into a huge long-term problem. Sir, you gave uh, some shocks, you know, to us that <laughs> in terms of... I didn't mean it. <laughs> no, no. In terms of monetary uh, policy the liquidity may be removed. Second, the rupee may appreciate. So, you know, uh, it may impact our uh, um, uh, exports. So, one thing which I have in mind, whether 
RBI may go for devaluation of the Indian rupee. No, no chance. No chance. Because That's we are already being labeled a we are on the currency manipulator watch list of the US. Okay. If we do a devaluation, all hell will break loose. Okay. There'll be major tariffs and you'll be much worse off you know, after the devaluation than this. Uh, but I think um, uh, what the, uh, the RBI will try and defend certain levels of the rupee. But if the dollar keeps declining, um, then uh, there is no way you can... But the, the advantage is that, you know, the euro is going to gain against uh, the dollar in this process of the dollar decline. So to the extent that you are exporting to Europe, uh, exporting to China, exporting to Korea, exporting to the Middle East, you are better off. Uh, so just don't look at it in isolation and say that, you know, the dollar rupee and this that's going to go up. Let's look at the cross currencies and also look at our competitors. Look at the Vietnamese dong, look at um, uh, Indonesian rupiah. They are appreciating faster than us. So I don't think it's a lost cause. But I, I would recommend you as a bank economist that please build in some appreciation of the rupee or some. Don't build in depreciation, at least major depreciation going forward. And if there is depreciation, if you are an exporter, uh, just in a book and take advantage of these periods of depreciation because depreciation will be the exception rather than the norm. Sir, uh, we are having at present $579 billion of foreign currency reserves. It's mainly because of the inflows. Yeah. I mean, uh, yes. will yes. this inflow continue and how best we can make use of this foreign currency reserves? Well, I think that that's the point that when you are talking about uh, a decline of the dollar, it simply suggests that the inflows will continue because the dollar has become a funding currency. So you're borrowing effectively in the dollar and you're putting money in uh, uh, you know, assets like the Indian stock market, which gives you better returns. Uh, you are getting uh, half a percent on US treasury bonds. In uh, Today, if you invest in the 10-year bond here, you will get a return of um, around uh, 6%. So the, clearly what we call the carry uh, trade is, uh, is to our advantage, unfortunately. So this is going to, uh, maybe the, the pace of uh, reserve accretion will slow down, but we will continue to see uh, reserves building up. The way to do it, I mean, it, the, the problem with Indian reserves is that um, it's we, we are a current account deficit economy. Maybe this year we will have a current account surplus, but that is the exception. But uh, current account, uh, unlike current account surplus economies, current account deficit economies find it very difficult to deploy their um, uh, reserves uh, on a long-term basis because there's always a claim on that. And also you have to see the composition of reserves uh, a lot of it is portfolio flows. Uh, the foreign international fund manager is the most unreliable creature in the world. He will <laughs> suddenly think that you know, and there is a, so so there is a problem of capital flight. So you can't you know th this reserve is not is a, is not a permanent gift to us. So we'll have to see how much of it is really solid. Maybe the flows that have come into geo and reliance retail. Those FDI type of flows yeah. are there for stay. And maybe we can uh, invest that in more high yielding assets like corporate bonds and so forth uh, abroad. But there is a limit to what we can do despite this illusion of high reserves. This is very different from China because China has a current account surplus. Uh, so that's the limited point that uh, I wanted to make. Sir, one more thing. Of course, I would not like to rebut you, but uh, you made a point that the central fiscal deficit will be 6%. 6.5%. 6 Whereas Chrysler, they have projected 8.8%. Uh, um, the Crystal Chief Economist is a <laughs> very close friend of mine. Yeah, he tends to be more of a pessimist than I am. Oh, yes. So I think it true. is a question. 
you know, partly a question of personality and perspective, <laughs> and I could be wrong. Um, I, I was, I as I said, I wanted to give you some good news <laughs> instead of just uh, immersing you in gloom, since we are talking in such difficult circumstances. Yes. Six and a half percent. I think it'll be closer to six and a half to seven percent. Um, Crystal could, you know, uh, th th you know, they they will have to revise things because I think this forecast was a uh, was based premised on a growth rate of uh, or a contraction of eleven percent or whatever that they were going with. Yeah. But I wouldn't like to comment on Crystal. You uh, please do uh, get in touch with my friend uh, Dharma Kirti Joshi. Uh, yes. he, will, he will make a more uh, a sadder case, a more gloomier case for the Indian. Okay. <laughs> there is Miss Kudwa. Uh, Miss Kudwa is a, with uh, a private uh, equity company called Omedia. Uh, she Omedia. moved out. Uh, Omedia. She moved out almost six or seven years ago. I am an ex uh, Crystal person myself. So yeah. Actually, yeah. you were in Crystal. Yeah. I was in Crystal many, many, many oh. decades ago. Oh. Okay. I think one uh, one more thing regarding moratorium, the issue is still pending in the Supreme Court. Right. So whether it can have an impact on the bank banking bottom lines or uh, NPAs? Uh, if it is a uh, no, I, I don't think it will be. Uh, uh, you know, if, if the loans are not being waived off. Uh, even if the interest charges are uh, waived off, then we hope to be compensated by the government. So if th that will be a fiscal burden for the government, for but for the banks, like all loan waivers, banks actually stand to gain because NPLs actually become more act potential NPLs actually uh, come to our you know it, uh, it come to our coffers because the government pays up and gives them a waiver. So I don't think it's a major NPL problem, but long term, you know, it, it could destroy the credit, uh, you know, culture if we do have a complete interest waiver. I think we've arrived at some compromise. The uh, the compensation between simple and compound interest rate, etc., which you're getting now, that was a compromise solution. But I don't think moratoria are the, are, are going to be the way forward. Sir, now I'll ask a very personal question. Yes. Uh, see. Uh, right. Um, is my bank SDFC bank right? There is no loss of business in Q1 and Q2. How it was possible? Look, um, you know, tradition, there is no, um, you know, magic, black magic or black art to this. Um, we have always grown at a considerable markup. To the growth rate in the banking system. This has varied from 12 to 15 percent, depending on the kind of market share gains that we could make. Uh, the banking system credit growth was 15 percent, our credit growth was 20 percent, partly because of uh, large market share gains and also because we are now very entrenched in the uh, rural and semi urban markets, which were less affected by the pandemic. Number three, we are largely a working capital bank, not so much a term finance bank. Working, there was still, you know, forty percent of the even during the most intense phase of the lockdown, forty uh, percent of uh, industry was operating. They needed working capital, so we gave it to them. So there is no magic to it. Uh, it's just a, a cumulative um, effect of certain strategic choices which we made, which turned out to be very. Uh, helpful in this, in this circumstance. Sir, in the last, let me have the privilege to say something good about my bank. My bank means HDFC bank. Oh, I'm, I'd be very happy to hear yeah. that. So, uh, this is for all the uh, you know people who are today attending this seminar. The market capitalization of HDFC bank, for, uh, which was $29 billion in 2010, has gone up to $107 billion in 2020. Second, it is the 10th most valuable bank in the world. Third, in 2020, I mean, it has consistently given a ROE of 17%. Four, and uh, fourth, this is something very astonishing. 
under the chairmanship of mr puri the shareholders return was 16000 times 16000 times so somebody who has invested 100 rupees is now worth 16 lakh rupees that is you know and secondly uh, what his parting gift was uh, mr puri was be simple and his three mantras were customer focus risk management and technology led innovation so mr barwa i think i have asked you a lot of question and very very uh, you know uh, it was a very enlightening evening though i was given 5 minutes but i have taken 30 minutes so i am really grateful to you and to ftcci team that i could ask whatever came to my mind thank you very much please and if you have any other khyati has my number yes uh, please take it from her and give me a ring we can always have a chat oh great <laughs> so i am more than happy yes. and i i take a, i i know i take a bow as a proud uh, veteran of hcfc bank and thank you so much for the very kind words and um, facts that you shared with the audience about our bank um, thank you thank you so much uh, uh, mr luharika we are now confused if we have mr barua from hdfc or we have uh, mr luharika yes. from hdfc we are like confused now <laughs> but uh, anyway we are glad to know and a lot of uh, people are praising the bank in fact in the you can just take it up are you okay mr barua do we do we have like next 5 minutes to no, absolutely my, my, yeah certainly thank you certainly. thank you uh, sir this question is from our uh, idc chairperson mr srinivas garmela uh, mr raguram rajan a few days ago cautioned that the liquidity overdrive that the governments of world over have undertaken could lead to insolvencies and thereby putting pressure on banks and some banks may go belly up can we have your views on this well that is certainly a risk uh, and the liquidity overdrive uh, as we were talking uh, ma'am uh, on inflation and the uh, the inflationary aspect of uh, high liquidity which is already being manifested in commodity prices but there is also a solvency issue uh, a problem of lending to the because you know banks have so much cash and they tend to uh, lend to the wrong people uh, we've seen this in the past there is certainly it, we need to be very very careful this is not over and the problem is that uh, you know one form of the crisis today we have a crisis of demand we have a crisis of uh, health uh, for it to become a financial crisis doesn't take very long so let's just be on our guard and i think uh, dr rajan has you know highlighted uh some of the risks going forward uh, yes and uh, this is from mr thirmalai sampath kumar he is our past president sir and yes. uh, uh, one of the multinational mutual debt fund has folded up citing covid do you see this to show up with others and it's only question of time Uh, no i do not think so i think that was an aberration i think they it was a it, it was indeed a very bad precedent to set in the market but i uh, um, you know the regulators just to be uh, very clear the the fund did not fold up it folded up some of its specific product mutual funds and um, uh, they are we the, the the money will be refunded so people haven't but that was not not a not, not a good thing to do uh, i'm i'm being very candid here i'm i, I don't usually uh, talk about um, other other companies but it is and and i think they've been pulled up i i personally can vouch for the fact that you will not see this happen uh, with uh, other funds uh, certainly not Yes, sir. This is one from Saurabh Gupta. Where do you see oil price? Will it uh, raise inflation further? 
Uh, yes, it will. And I think oil is basically like a financial asset and financial assets are um, very sensitive to the amount of liquidity in the global system So and, and to expectations of improved growth. Both are happening. One is because of the vaccine and the other is because central banks are now, you know, they, they, they just don't want to take any chances. They don't want to reduce liquidity. So there is an upside to oil prices from here, and that is poten certainly potentially inflationary for an oil importer like India. Uh, so you know, for a country like Russia or Indonesia, to a certain extent, it's very good. Saudi Arabia is good, but for us, we'll have to think of the inflationary potential of that, and not just oil, but uh, commodities in general, as we, we were discussing earlier. Yes, uh, one uh, just last question. Uh, this is from Mr. Sanyasi Rao, the managing committee member of FTCCI. He says that, is it that the government has to now reduce the expenditure on populist schemes? Uh, I think there will be, there'll have to be some consolidation. I mean, I think you, and, and the, the, the problem with populist schemes is that it's very difficult in normal times to, uh, you know, withdraw from it. Uh, but a, in a crisis, uh, you can, you know, use that to, um, as as um, a reason to to consolidate, but having said that, uh, I am uh, very uh, distressed by the kind of um, issues that have cropped up around the farm sector reforms. I thought there was considerable uh, consensus on the need for that. Uh, it's a tough political task. You know, we can talk about consolidation. We can talk about crisis being an opportunity, etc. But I think what is happening around me, since I live in, in Delhi and I have uh, you know, blockades <laughs> all over the place, just reminds you that how difficult it is to wind up or consolidate uh, populist schemes. I have one question for Dr. Yes, Mr. Inani. Yes. Uh, under political compulsions, the government is increasing the MSP prices. For example, the price of international price of uh, maize is only 10 rupees 60 paisa, whereas our India is 17. Whether this leads to inflation? It, it certainly does. It certainly does. It uh, leads to inflation. It leads to fiscal problems because issue price and MSP, because we are subsidizing part of it and uh, we are raising. So MSP, uh, broadly, the problem is that it does not track international prices and every year there is uh, expected to be an increase but we've got into, got into this trap of offering our um, MSPs every year and that is one big source and con uh, uh, a continuous source of inflation for us and we, we can we see when, when you try to do anything which remotely affects this kind of guarantee that farmers get uh, on MSPs what the uh, backlash can be. Uh, it's it, we. I, I think we've uh, we we have to handle this very carefully. But that is a major source of inflation for us. Secondly, after this blockade by the farmers, we found that a very less number of uh, economic analysts and business dailies coming in support of the uh, novel uh, agri bills, uh, even though they are for the reforms for the agriculture sector and for the benefit of the farmers. What is the reason? No, I, I do, wouldn't agree with you. I think people like Dr. Ashok Gulati, for instance, who was the chairman of the Agricultural Prices Commission, there have been a number of people who have uh, written in favor of um, uh, my friend Surjit Bhalla, uh, a number of economists I can identify who have uh, uh, you know, emphasized the uh, case for uh, these farm bills. And these have been in, you know, in the pipeline and every government has been trying to push this through. Uh, of course, I, I think the, econo the, the economists who have kind of criticized it have said that you know, it, could, it could have been done a little more um, diplomatically. There could have been some discussion with the farmers, etc. and so forth. But I really don't think there is a strong case uh, that uh, I mean, there are a lot of issues. Small farmers need more marketing support and so forth. Enam really hasn't taken off in a very big way. All these things have to be there. But I, I, I think the government does have a very, very strong case for doing what it did.
So what is your opinion whether the vaccine has been invented? Sorry? Um, I, well, I, I, Pfizer and Moderna, uh, I, I think this new RMNA uh, technology, which is a revolutionary technology, seems to be yielding uh, good results. Uh, there seem to be some issues with the more conventional uh, one, which is the uh, Oxford AstraZeneca one. I, I don't think the issues are uh, that uh, severe. Uh, it will take just a few more weeks. So I think the vaccine is there. And uh, the place where you, the, 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 uh, the people who will answer this question most categorically for you are investors in the stock market. So if you weigh <laughs> the stock market, and they always have a lot of it. So if, if you look at the stock market, you will know that the vaccine has been, is there established. And of course, you know, more seriously, the UK has started the vaccination program. Uh, adverse effects have been minimal. US has started. This one person has got a severe allergy, but apart from that, it's uh, it's it's going fine. It's going fine. Thank you. So one more sir, one thing. Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, one more question in Q and A, Mr. Shekhar was asking. Mm -hmm. This is regarding low GDP versus uh, stock market, which I was also interested. Even though GDP is very low, why the stock market is going up? Uh, well, you know, the stock market is uh, the, um, the there are two ways to explain this. One is the stock market is forward looking, and it is it has been pricing in the fact that at some point a vaccine will be uh, discover, uh, discovered and you know, things will pick up going forward. But I think the bigger reason is that if you pump in and you, 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 we've seen this in the past, if you pump in so much money in the system, right? It has to, it just chases high yielding assets. You will not put, if you have so much cash uh, that initially you say, okay, I have uh, you know, 500 rupees with me. Let me put 400 rupees in uh, fixed deposits, 100 rupees in the stock market. Then the central banks come along and give you 1000 rupees. So you say, okay, let's just, so it's just a function of global liquidity. And that is going to continue. And it is going to sort of inflate. So there is, I have never, you know, really sort of seen a, a strong relationship between GDP and, and the stock market because the stock markets tend to look forward. And, you know, having been in the stock markets myself for a considerable period of time, if there is a lot of liquidity in the system, stock investors will find stories to justify the fact that they have so much cash that they are chasing the assets. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we just have the last question. Uh, Mr. Barua, your uh, take on the on India not joining the RCEP. Um, let me just sort of be very open with you. I, I, I think we should have been a part of that. Uh, I, I think the, the, uh, the costs uh, the, the the benefits outweigh the cost. Having said that, our experience with FTAs have been have been very bad, starting with the, the Thai FTA with Thailand. But uh, not being a part of such a large club, where slowly you see regionalization becoming a key driver of global trade, I, I don't agree with it. And I'm being very honest with you. This uh, people will have a different opinion, but I'm. You know, I, I, I think we should have uh, been a member of, of that. Although I, I do believe that the China's um, muscle flexing would have been a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking all the questions. And uh, thank you, Mr. Luharika, for uh, conducting the Q&A, moderating the Q&A. And we come towards the end of our uh, event. And... Um, I request our Vice President, Mr. Ranil Agarwal, to kindly propose the vote of thanks. Unmute yourself. It is my privilege to propose vote of thanks on this prestigious endowment lecture. On behalf of Federation, I thank Mr. Abhik Barua, Chief Economist and Executive Vice President, HDFC Bank, for sparing his valuable time and enlighten us on rebounding Indian economy way forward. I also thank 
अभिषेक टिब्रेवाला जी मैनेजिंग ट्रस्टी एंड अरुण द्वारका जी ट्रस्टी ऑफ ओपी टिब्रेवाला फाउंडेशन फॉर देयर सपोर्ट इन ऑर्गेनाइजिंग दिस मेमोरियल लेक्चर इनफैक्ट दे हैव कमिटेड टू स्टैब्लिश दिस एंडोमेंट लेक्चर एवरी ईयर आई थैंक मैनेजिंग कमिटी मेंबर्स पास्ट प्रेसिडेंट एंड द इनवाइटीज एंड पार्टिसिपेंट्स आई थैंक मीडिया और देर कवरेज थैंक यू वन एंड ऑल thank you very much thank you sir thank, thank you, you so much thank you thank you udar ha kya luar ka ji q and a ke aur ke uske chat box ke to liye hi nahi aap to aap mat kyun <laughs> वो अच्छा है ना उनको चांस मिला हमारे सुजाता मैडम को चांस मिला शी को टास्क यू नो भाई हमारे तो क्या है क्वेश्चन अलग टाइप के थे को सेंटर लो